Hello, and welcome to everybody to another I5K webinar. I think it looks like we've got a good group of people already signed in. I suspect we'll have a few more here signing in as, as we give the introduction. I just want to welcome you all and let you know that um, if, if anybody's called in as a group, if you could go ahead and send me, uh, Anna Childers, a chat just to let me know how many people are in your group. That would really help us just to kind of keep some metrics on these webinars. Um, everyone should be muted upon entering the conference. If you're not, if you could go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, but if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and either ask your question verbally or go ahead and uh, ask your question through the chat function at any time. And if you can send that uh, message to everyone, I think we'll go ahead and that will allow our speaker to see the messages and he can answer them on his own rather than having me um, asking them specifically. If you do go ahead and send them to me, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and re-chat them out to the group. Uh, so feel free if you'd prefer to do that, I, I can do that for you. Finally, um, I just want to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Ms. Uh, Dr. Ben Busby, who's the Genomic Outreach Coordinator and Bioinformatics Training Lead at NCBI. And Ben, I'll let you take it away. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Um, hope uh, everybody is having a fantastic Wednesday. And um, I may not be able to see uh, chats during the talk just uh, because of some technical issues with Windows 10. Um, but um, uh, regardless, um, please feel free to interject with questions as we go through the talk. Um, and I really hope you enjoy this. Uh, this is uh, it's both a high-level overview and fairly technical, talking about some of the new things that are going on with SCBI. As you all know, um, you know, I5K has been doing amazing stuff, uh, you know, sort of provisioning blast searches, collecting data, all of that type of stuff. And I want to talk to you about some of the new stuff uh, we're doing it in CBI. And then at the, the end, uh, what I'd like to do is, is maybe we could have a brief discussion about uh, ways we could work together uh, moving forward. And that's, uh, that's something I'm particularly excited about. So this talk is going to be split up into two general parts, well, really three general parts. First, I'll give a little bit of an overview on some of the new stuff we're doing with next generation sequencing data and enabling access to new next generation sequencing data. Then I'm going to walk through a workflow uh, really quick, one that I think is particularly fun. And uh, I, I was actually, uh, I, I thought it was uh, pretty cool and I told my wife about it at breakfast this morning. She thought it was pretty cool too, so hopefully you do as well. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it has to do with Wolbachia endosymbionts of uh, Brugia mali. And then uh, finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work my group has do been doing, prototyping software in a hackathon setting. Um, and that's something else I'd love uh, to work with I5K on. Uh, so today I have quite a few slides. Uh, I have about 80 or 90 slides. So I'm going to channel my inner Chris Mason. I'm going to speak very quickly. Uh, but again, if you uh, if you miss something, please feel free to stop me. And if there's stuff you want to go back to, uh, please note that in the chat module, I put a link to all of these slides. Uh, so you can download them and do what you wish. Uh, I myself am a government employee, so all the slides are in public domain. That said, uh, anything I say uh, should be construed as my personal opinion and not the opinion of uh, my agency or the federal government. All right, uh, so diving right into it, I work for NCBI. As you all know, we house the world's biomedical literature, as well as being the largest genomic database in the world. Um, we have about 53 uh, databases that are non-literature, uh, as well as hosting GLASS and some other tools. Um, so in case the uh, rest of the hour is a total waste to you, uh, I, I really, uh, I'm a big believer in not wasting anybody's time, and so, uh, I like to talk a little bit about literature at the beginning of my talk, so so at least the hope is that in the next year everyone gets their time back. So um, as uh, most of you probably use PubMed at least occasionally, I know that uh, PubMed is probably not the be all and end all for uh, arthropod genomics, but at least there's quite a bit of literature there. And uh, so as you know, we have PubMed and PMC, and I really try to remind people to use the advanced search features. Uh, in PubMed, uh, there's a lot of ways to narrow things down, and we'll see some more complex searches uh, a little bit later in this talk. Um, I also want to tell you a lot of people are very interested in metadata, and we do have a metadata API. For those of you who are bioinformaticians, 
Uh, you've probably seen eUtils before, and so now we have a command line interface uh, for you eUtils called eDirect. But my group did an experiment uh, starting about uh, a year ago where we decided we could put up a cookbook for eDirect to do some relatively complex searches. For example, a lot of people really want to be able to pull sequent fast days for specified taxonomic designations. We're able to write a command line one-liner for being able to do that. So if you're interested in such searches, please check it out. The other thing that was really neat to us is we wanted this to be a community project, and we wanted people to be able to, to interact with it. So this whole thing actually sits on GitHub. You can go there, and if there are searches you'd like to do that you can't quite figure out, what you can do is you can go and put in a get, an issue on GitHub, and that goes to the, my cell phone, that goes to the cell phone of the head of the education group at NLM, as well as uh, the head of the education group at NCBI. So that's a great way to be able to ask uh, command line questions uh, if you have issues. Um, now uh, a lot of people are interested in doing natural language processing type searches. Uh, you can also use eDirect to cache a local copy of PubMed. It'll update uh, whenever you set the frequency, so you can have it update weekly, nightly, so on. And also, um, you can also grab that data by FTP. One thing we find is that people build NLP style tools, but they don't update the corpora, which is often PubMed. So we built something called PubRunner. This is a tool that's in alpha, um, but basically what we were able to do is uh, build a system which updates uh, the PubMed corpora uh, or corpus for natural language processing tools. The other thing that might be relevant to this group is uh, we were able to uh, merge that uh, with the abstracts for PubAg. So if you go into the GitHub site, uh, you should be able to find a merged PubMed, PubAg corp, uh, corpus. Uh, so that may be of interest to some of you. And, and I can send you more information about that if you like. Uh, for more information on the literature stuff, uh, please check out uh, our Learn page uh, or just Google for uh, NCBI webinars. Another thing I like to say to other groups who we collaborate with uh, on this note is that um, all of our slides for webinars, for, for presentations, all of our uh, help documents, those are all uh, produced by the U.S. government uh, and so all in the public domain. So if, uh, if you're doing any teaching at your institution and want resources to teach, uh, you, you can just take our slides uh, and use them for whatever you need. So I, I find that sometimes helpful to educators. So for those of you who are in bioinformaticians, I'd like to go through uh, sort of uh, next generation sequencing, bioinformatics in about eh, probably 30 seconds. Uh, so basically we come off an Illumina sequencer, now long reads are on board, so we have Manipool and Backpack Bio. But anyway, still typically most sequencing is done with Illumina. And what we either do is map to a reference sequence, and then uh, we call variants. And we call variants not just for human, but for lots of stuff, as most of you know. And then we also do assembly. Uh, and as I'll tell you later, some of the inspiration for work in my group has been uh, has been trying to assemble really funky organisms, uh, in particular uh, some large jellyfish. Um, and so that's uh, that's that's uh, sort of next generation sequencing in a nutshell. So the way we organize uh, this data, so at NCBI we have uh, the SRA database. Um, which most of it is uh, totally public and unrestricted, and then some of it is in dbGaP, Database of Genotypes and Phenotypes, which is individual level genotype phenotype data on humans. Anyway, the public SRA, which is, again, about uh, 10 petabases or so, um, the data is organized uh, into BioProject, and lots of other databases fall under the BioProject umbrella, uh, particularly GEO, which many of you may be familiar with. The nice thing about BioProject is that you can actually filter things on uh, data types and you can filter based on multiple data types. So that's quite a nice thing. And also in BioProject, you'll see a project summary as well as links to publication as and the raw data sets themselves. Uh, for folks that are NIH funded, uh, we actually do uh, link grant numbers to uh, BioProject uh, so that uh, this can go uh, back to program officers and show that uh, PIs are uh, compliant with the genomic data sharing requirements of NIH. Um, 
But really where the rubber meets the road is a place called BioSample, which houses our metadata. And as any of you that have done large-scale genomic work know, uh, this, this is really uh, where a lot of problems uh, in sort of data sharing lie. Um, and we really try to encourage uh, folks to give us as much metadata as possible. Uh, we have a collaborations with CEDAR um, and some other groups that are uh, sort of harmonizing GEO uh, to try to make metadata better. Uh, I have someone in my group right now, uh, Kim LeBlanc, uh, who's working on extracting mesh terms from grants, bio projects, and bio samples. Uh, but if, uh, if I5K, if this is something you're interested in, uh, we can work together to promote bigger, better metadata. Uh, that's something I'm very interested in personally. Um, so this is where the metadata lives. By the way, bio project or bio sample, you can download everything by XML. You can also uh, access that via eDirect. Um, but really, we really would like to get investigators to look at the bio sample templates before they even start collecting data. Because if they collect data, uh, with metadata that's consistent with our biosample templates, I think that's something that is very, very useful in terms of data sharing on the back end. Um, and so uh, here uh, we can see the biosample template for uh, invertebrates, and we really only require five fields. And some investigators will only put five fields, but we try to get people to give us as much data as possible. Also, two things a lot of people don't know, you can add any columns you want to a biosample submission, so you can put in additional metadata, and also you can submit this data by XML. So there's an XML schema um, that is accessible uh, in the same place that uh, you get these uh, you get these particular biosample templates. And like I said, just Google for that; it's reasonably easy to find on the internet. So, but so we found that historically, a lot of metadata is insufficient. Um, and so uh, we've been experimenting with ways uh, to index the SRA. And uh, one way uh, that we've found uh, that people really like uh, that we've indexed the SRA uh, is we've indexed it all uh, by mapping uh, KMERS um, and, and we've taxonomically indexed uh, the entire database. And so here, uh, if you put a particular taxonomic analysis, here I've looked at, at uh, um, I've looked for uh, E. coli, and uh, here I can see I haven't looked for E. coli in this search, but uh, here I can see an individual um, run uh, with uh, taxonomic delineation uh, from um, uh, mastitis uh, E. coli run. Here we can see uh, pages like we would expect. Um, and uh, here we can look for alpha herpes virus. That's what I was searching for before. And we can see that there's herpes viruses in lots of different metagenomes. And we can filter that in the SRA run selector. We'll come back to the run selector again um, when, uh, when we work through an example. So, and here I can see that that alpha herpes virus I searched for, uh, most of it is quite consistent. Um, with uh, known alpha herpes, alpha herpes viruses, uh, and then there's a little bit at the end. And you can just do that uh, simply by sending uh, these things to BLAST. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that later. So, but how to extract the data um, is often a problem. Uh, if you remember before I, uh, I showed um, that uh, you know, sort of in 2000, circa 2013 bioinformatics, uh, you sort of dump the data, then you do uh, some mapping, and then you sort, then you index, and this ends up making sort of a triplicate copy of data, which to my mind is not ideal. So here's what we've been working on in that sense. So instead of dumping the data, which can be messy and also huge if you're dealing with tens of thousands of data sets, you can just use BLAST. A lot of people think it's a bit uh, sort of primitive and, and slow, and, and that was true um, even for command line BLAST. But relatively recently, uh, we've released a tool called Magic BLAST. And Magic BLAST allows us to do a lot of things. So basically um, what this does is it allows uh, BLAST, uh, actually a nucleotide optimized BLAST, or uh, next generation sequencing optimized BLAST, to read directly from the SRA. By the way, IDBLAST can do this too. 
uh, as well as SR Prism, and, and HiSET as well. So here's the documentation. You can just grab a binary. Um, and you can find something to blast into. So in this particular example, say I'm interested in uh, Boogie MLE, and uh, I have some problems with it. And so there's some leads, uh, you know, uh, working with the actual Wolbachia uh, and the aspartate semi-aldehyde semi dehydrogenase. So we actually have a number of data sets on Wolbachia, and it does a lot of comparative analyses. So say I wanted a quick way uh, to look at the expression, presence, the variance uh, in this particular gene uh, in the Wolbachia endosymbiont. So um, I think even a couple of years ago, that would have been an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, but now uh, it's uh, reasonably straightforward. Uh, so, and that's something we can do. So um, this is where I'm gonna go really fast. I'm gonna show some very sort of basic, straightforward bioinformatics. Uh, and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna speak very, very quickly. Uh, if you want the details of this, please just jump on this slide share. I even sent the specific link to the chat. Um, and you, you can pick some of this stuff up. So basically what I can do is search for this gene name in Wolbachia, and uh, I can actually just click on the NCBI gene database. Here I see uh, a bunch of stuff, but I actually don't see uh, the Wolbachia in the organism I'm interested in, um, which is unfortunate. But I do see Melanogaster. So what I can do is go ahead and look at the Melanogaster Wolbachia, as many of you probably know, uh, Magellanogaster Wolbachia is reasonably well characterized. Um, and so here I can see uh, the gene um, in context in Drosophila Magellanogaster Wolbachia. Um, and then so if I right click on that, here I can get a, a whole bunch of information. But what I can do is actually just blast that protein sequence. As most of you know, protein blast will give me uh, a lot of information content, and then I can blast that into the endosymbiont in Brugge and Mali. Um, I personally like using Delta Blast these days. Uh, I'm able to find stuff. Um, uh, it, it's a very sensitive blast search. Uh, we used to have a challenge for uh, our sort of 500 level bioinformatics students where we'd uh, ask them to go out and find a novel gene. Uh, we borrowed that from Jonathan Pevzer. Uh, they used to have lots of trouble looking through algal sequences and stuff, but now when the blast came out, it became relatively trivial. Anyway, so I can blast uh, this protein into Brugia melli. And by the way, uh, so I'm able to filter just for that Wolbachia endosymbiont, and now you can do that for Blast Plus. Uh, it's uh, not super streamlined yet, but the functionality is there, and so you can filter uh, your uh, favorite blast database that you get from NCBI based on taxonomy. That's uh, something a lot of people have asked and I think particularly relevant to this group. So please check out this link. And at the end of the talk, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll put it up um, on the chat. Great, so what I can see here is that when I blast this particular gene in, uh, I get one very clear hit, uh, which is in fact annotated as the aspartate semi-aldehyde dehydrogenase. Um, uh, this Wolbachia symbiont, so that's great. Uh, if I go ahead and click on that WP accession, um, I can see that it's not all that different from the uh, Melanogaster. Now, some of you might be experts in this particular field. Uh, if you were a Wolbachia expert, uh, you might know things about these particular domains. Uh, I don't know a whole bunch of the, about those particular domains. What I can say is uh, I think I'm more or less looking at the same uh, protein. So. So then uh, I can proceed forward. Um, I can click, oh, sorry, that's scrolling down in the blast search. And then I can click on the actual uh, accession here for that. And I could get the nucleotide sequence by clicking on nucleotide, but I can also click on the identical proteins link here. One nice thing is that'll allow me to see identical proteins in other species. Obviously, this is most relevant to bacteria and viruses, but then in addition, uh, I can see uh, this nucleotide region. The nice thing is uh, I can click on that um, and I can see all of this. If I scroll down, I can see the protein sequence and the nucleotide sequence as you would expect for GenBank format. But more importantly, 
if I click on the FASTA link here, I can I can grab the FASTA for just that nucleotide sequence. So I think that's something that's that's relatively straightforward. And again, you can sort of follow the steps here for anything that you want to do. Now, when I get this, uh, I can copy and paste. I can W get. I can do whatever I need to do uh, to go ahead and move this onto my Linux system. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk about using Linux. But I would like nobody to be deterred because this is simple enough Linux that you can learn how to do it in, in a couple of hours. And I'll show you how to do that. So say I go to some data. So I, uh, I go ahead, I mentioned that I can search for Wolbachia, Rugia Mali, and I can look for RNA seq data. And uh, here, so I can filter by RNA in this Wolbachia. And what I can do is I see I have 54 runs here, and I can send the results to the SRA run selector. The nice thing about that is I can see lots of data here. I can filter it. The metadata is not too bad. There's much more data off to the side of the screen. So that's pretty cool. I can look for male, female Wolbachia. I can look at mature, immature, that kind of thing. Uh, that organism, not the Wolbachia. Uh, but anyway, uh, but here's how easy it is uh, to then leverage Magic Blast. So if you're not, this is where I'm going to talk about Linux for just a couple slides. But if you're not familiar with this, uh, I encourage you to check out software carpentry taking a course or just going through the lessons on your own, you probably learn enough Linux to do this in four to six hours. Uh, so that's something I think is pretty cool. So I can go grab Magic Blast, and I've done a fresh installation here. Uh, I can go ahead and grab it. Um, I'll, uh, I can just go ahead and grab it, and then I can just open it up and deploy it. Uh, when I was first learning Linux, for those of you who are new to this, uh, I thought I would have to memorize lots of things like dash XVZF, but it's pretty much the only one. So uh, no reason to, to worry about it. And then all I have to do is make a BLAST database out of that sequence I showed you before. And then I can just directly call uh, whatever SRO I'm interested in and BLAST that over um, the particular gene sequence I'm interested in. So that's something that I find, uh, I find particularly cool. Um, and that is very, very easy to do. Um, and so here are the basic commands again. And again, this is uh, this is line. And here uh, I can see I'm just running this on my Mac. No big deal. And in fact, uh, the first time I did a demo like this, I actually put it together on a plane flying to California. So I was somewhere over Colorado, actually streaming data out of a ten petabase data set uh, over a gene locus uh, while I was flying. So I, I really felt that I lived in the 21st century, uh, and that was that was very exciting. So, and here uh, you get a SAM file. Uh, so that's, that is actually the default, although you can get your traditional command line blast outputs too. Uh, I will admit that this is a tiny bit of dog and pony show uh, because um, I, I just started the blast just before this talk on the Brugge and Mali. So this is actually uh, running over back a bacterial gene. But you see the structure of the SAM file. Uh, you see that uh, when you're hanging off, this is actually sorted by, by location. When you're hanging off, uh, you don't get as many matches. Uh, and then you start to get matches, uh, you know, sort of total matches with just a couple of mismatches if you're used to reading SAM files. Uh, and so that's a pretty good sign, which you'd expect to see with bacteria there. Uh, and I can do similar searches on the web, as I alluded to. So here I've just taken a human endogenous retrovirus um, and uh, or a gene from a human endogenous retrovirus and blasted it uh, into the genome of NA12878, uh, who's a woman in Utah who's been sequenced about 2,600 times. So, um, so the nice thing is, um, you can do this thing with other software. So uh, GATK, uh, you can use with this as well as HiSET, um, which was uh, written by Ben Langmead and colleagues uh, to do uh, sort of streaming or to do RNA seq mapping. Can also do streaming from SRA, uh, and that's something we're particularly excited about: is end users uh, not having to use uh, the SRA toolkit um, and do 
dumping FastQ onto their uh, local things. But the amazing thing to me, for those of you who are tool developers, is that you can take the SRA toolkit functionality that Magic Blast uh, and HiSet 2 have, and you can actually uh, port that into your own software uh, by using uh, the NCBI NGS uh, software development kit. And so that's something we really encourage people to do. And as a personal favor to me, if you use STAR uh, and you know Alex Dobbin, please send him a note harassing him uh, to put the NGS uh, in front of STAR. Uh, that would be would be awesome uh, if, if we could have everybody do that. And I say that in a lot of talks. Uh, so eventually, hopefully, it'll catch up to him. He's a nice guy, by the way. Oh, no offense to Alex. I just need to get it up on his priority queue. Um, Anyway, uh, another thing that might be relevant uh, to some of you is uh, we have a prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline. Obviously, we have a eukaryotic one as well, and now there's a button to ask for annotation of eukaryotes. Uh, but one thing we're doing is we're currently in the process of externalizing our prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline. So this is a pipeline with about 79 steps, and uh, we're actually externalizing it as uh, as a whole bunch of Docker modules wrapped in common workflow language uh, for those of you who are on sort of the developmental side of bioinformatics. Um, and also I'd like to note that we have a new tool called Sparkle. And what this does is it clusters gene families based on protein domain organization. And as I mentioned with Delta Blast, it's a very sensitive way uh, to look for things, um, but also it allows unambiguous naming. Uh, if we're uh, if we're tag if we're annotating things in bacterial or even other genomes, uh, because we can name them based on uh, the presence and organization of functional domains. Uh, I mentioned the eDirect code before, uh, and again, there's there's lots and lots of stuff there, and uh, here's more information on NCBI in general uh, for lots of these things. Uh, there's handbooks, fact sheets, and webinars. Um, so uh, with the last part of the talk, just for the next uh, sort of 10 or 15 minutes, I want to tell you about some things we've built off of Just really as proof of principle, uh, proof of principle prototypes uh, to show where we can go uh, with, these, uh, with these approaches. So uh, this one is not arthropod specific, but I, I suspect the next example will be a little bit more relevant. But actually, you could call any SNPs. Uh, so basically, we're able to call SNPs on the fly. So no dumping, no mapping, no sorting, no vari uh, variant calling per se. Uh, we're just going and we're blasting uh, reads over uh, the variants and their flanking regions from DB SNP, and then uh, just calling heads into homozygotes from there. So that's a particularly exciting thing to me. Uh, and with humans, we've been able to build Dockerized containers that investigators can send to others uh, to look for genotype-phenotype uh, associations. Um, I mentioned that uh, we had uh, worked in my group um, on assembling the Alatina Alata genome, which turned out to be actually kind of immensely complicated. So we, um, we uh, really, um, we, we started assembling the genome and realized, so by Kamer count, it was supposed to be somewhere on the order of three gigabases, which seems uh, rather big for a Nadarian. Um, it turned out that a lot of that sequence was, were viruses, both exogenous and endogenous viruses. And so what we set out to do was actually build a virus detection pipeline that could detect both endogenous and exogenous viruses. Um, and one of the things we started doing this, um, we would actually uh, find uh, viral proteins, viral orthologs, viral domains, um, and we expanded on this logic um, by building the world's most primitive De Bruyne grapher. So basically what we do is um, we use the magic blast technique I showed you earlier to stream reads out of SRA and then assemble by mega hit or mega uh, meta spades. Um, and then we decorate these things with domains, but then we go back and chop off the terminal 500 nucleotides and run things back through the pipeline although we typically don't assemble uh, every time for computational costs. And this allows us to detect both uh, novel exogenous as well as novel endogenous viruses. We're also able now to detect, uh, we, it, 
a guy named Jan Buchmann uh, implemented that um, in Python, and now we're able to detect viral family as well. So uh, that's something that we're particularly proud of. And, uh, and, and this was built uh, in a series of hackathons, and so about 35 or 40 people were involved in building these pipelines, and through uh, osf.io, we're able to give them all credit by getting DOIs for their GitHub repos. So I mentioned we built the last two families of tools uh, that, that I showed you in hackathons. So now uh, NCBI, myself, and Alyssa Dillman are running NCBI hackathons about 12 a year at this point. Um, and what we do in these collaborative hackathons is we pre-scope projects, put teams of five to six strangers on them, and then they work on these projects uh, for three consecutive nine-hour days. So it's not, we're not locking people in in the middle of the night, none of that. Um, and 80% of teams finish, uh, get a software prototype to the alpha or beta stage. And that's something we're extremely proud of. And again, these are prototypes. They're not meant to be production software. But what they are meant to do is push the limits of what we think we can do with bioinformatics. Um, and so I'm going to show you just a couple examples of that. So we built a really simple to use antibiotic detection, uh, antibiotic resistance detection pipeline, and now we're able to use that with upper level undergrads. So that's, that's something that I'm very excited about. We have a collaboration with San Diego State University as well as the City University of New York uh, to let un upper level undergrads look for novel viruses um, as well as antibiotic resistance proteins. Uh, we've built educational resources in this hackathon. About 3,000 people have learned to map RNA-seq data uh, with this RNA-seq mapper. We integrated that into a MOOC, again built by a team led by Frederick Tan in a hackathon. Uh, we're transitioning our tutorials, and by the way, I've seen the tutorials on uh, I5K. In my opinion, they look great. Um, and we're transitioning our tutorials now uh, to really be centered around BioPython. Uh, at least for sort of the computational genomics teaching. Uh, one thing we've done in the educational space lately is uh, we built a tutorial uh, for Nanopore uh, that we think is simple enough for high school students to use. But that's something really exciting because we think there's really a lot of uh, sort of interest in citizen engagement around genomics. And, and we think Nanopore may be, or at least I personally think Nanopore may be a catalyst to that. Um, and now, um, it's interesting to me because even five or six years ago, we thought integrating ChIP-seq and RNA-seq data was really something for pro-bioinformaticians. And now we have a, a, a self-guided Jupyter Notebook tutorial uh, for folks being able to do that. And, and probably upper-level undergrads or uh, beginning grad students uh, would, would be able to go through this pipeline. So it's interesting to see technologically how things uh, become similar. Um, We've used this, uh, we've used hackathons to establish collaborations. So this is a slide from the GA4GH. We were able to glue their API to our API, uh, which really leads to interoperability. And in terms of pushing the boundaries of bioinformatics, so as far as I know, we were the first people to load entire human genomes into graphs. Um, that was done by uh, just a fantastic team at, at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, so we were able to do that. And we've been able to leverage uh, techniques like machine learning. Here we're looking at contamination in agricultural genomes. Um, and with uh, BLAST, you see about 91% sensitivity uh, in terms of things that are in the database. However, as things uh, are not in the database or diverse from the known databases, um, sensitivity of, for contamination drops off. We were able to take uh, nucleotide 8 MERS and uh, put them into a 20-dimensional vector space, um, and then we can get relatively comparable sensitivity uh, really for somewhat alien nucleotide sequences. So that's something we're particularly proud of. Uh, this, the reason I show this is because uh, there was a team that wanted to come and uh, build an RNA-seq visualization tool in aging, and I encouraged them to look at how many RNA-seq tools are out there already. They came back a few minutes later and said, in a cursory search, we found 36. And I said, okay, 
Well, maybe we can do something that works with the community instead of just making the more of a mess. And they said, okay, we'll build a module that works with a bunch of visualization tools. And that's what they did. Uh, so they built a module for looking at whole genome expression and aging. Uh, and I was, I was really very proud of that. Um, and now we're really pushing the limits of ease of use. So here uh, we have a prototype, uh, which we worked on with three hackathon teams to just look at gene expression on the fly from raw FASTQ or raw SRA data sets. And so that's something that I think is really neat when we can say case control, here's my gene, here's, uh, here's what I want out of it. And uh, actually somebody uh, from I5K uh, came to one of the hackathons and, and was really instrumental uh, in getting uh, this off the ground, which can call variants from uh, bulk RNA-seq as well as single cell RNA-seq. Um, and I think that's really sort of pushing the boundaries of what we can do. But we really uh, were able to show some neat somatic variants uh, in diabetic pancreas. So now we're moving uh, sort of again to the boundaries, uh, being able, to, I know this is not so relevant to this group, uh, being able to translate from EMRs uh, into sort of public genomic databases. But this probably will be relevant, relevant to this group. I know you guys work a lot with cybers. We're also working a lot with folks at cybers in terms of uh, containerizing things. And in fact, the team that made this graphic um, uh, actually uh, was led by somebody, Upendra, uh, that works in cybers. Uh, but anyway, we were able to, uh, we're able to dockerize things um, and really make uh, workflows modular, which is something we're extremely proud of. So we've been jumping into other people's hackathons. Uh, we've been doing patient-centered hackathons uh, with an organization called SB.AI. Um, and I'll be at uh, BOSC, uh, some of you may be there, uh, I'll be at the BOSC hackathon at the end of the GCC BOSC conference, uh, working with uh, Brad Chapman to establish a website of a whole bunch of uh, bioinformatics and biomedical data science hackathons. Um, for example, uh, we're friends with the Apollo folks. I don't know if any of you were on the phone, uh, but they had a hackathon in January in San Diego. And uh, really logistically, it probably would have been beneficial to everybody uh, if we had put the hackathons together. Um, and like I said, we're all friends and we're all scientists, so uh, there's really not a whole lot of uh, disadvantages to doing that, in my opinion. Um, so. One thing I'm particularly excited about is uh, in these hackathons, I told you that about 80% of teams uh, finish a project they're proud of, but also about 10% of the teams publish a manuscript on, on what they work on in the hack. And I, I really think that's fantastic, particularly for young graduate students. Most of the attendees are gra graduate students or postdocs or developers from the community, but particularly for the graduate students, having an extra paper out, uh, even which was primarily done in, in the three days they were working on it, plus some post hoc editing, uh, is a, something I think that's very beneficial to their careers. Um, and now we're really trying to sort of create a community of both hackathoners as well as uh, getting other projects in. And if I5K, uh, if there are projects you'd like to work on uh, in hackathons, uh, just to prototype things, uh, I'm all ears and, and would love to hear about it. And uh, particularly uh, in Boulder, um, in June, this is a hackathon we built uh, really around, well, we built a conference around this hackathon. So there'll be a day and a half workshop on containerization uh, and workflows, somewhat similar to the one Cybers did a few months ago, uh, as well as a uh, workshop on RNA-seq, and then a one-day plenary session on RNA-seq precision medicine and metagenomics. Uh, ben Langmead will be keynoting that. And then finally, uh, a three-day ha hackathon where we uh, really build a lot of prototype tools. Uh, and we're running uh, four sort of Sensu Strict 2 NCBI style hackathons this summer. So uh, anyone you'd like to be involved in, uh, I'd, or multiple if you want, uh, I'd be all ears to hear that. Uh, really, one thing, uh, another thing I'm very proud of with the hackathons is uh, that they, the structure seems to be relatively resilient to weather conditions. Uh, so this was a recent hackathon we had uh, where they closed the NIH. Um, and this, these are a bunch of hackathoners. Um, standing on the street in Bethesda as we were moving venues. Um, so also, uh, I have a core of visiting bioinformaticians. Uh, one of them is actually in the back of the room with me right now. Um, and uh, so folks come uh, to work in my group at NCBI for four to six weeks. 
uh, if you have folks that are interested, uh, we really get them embedded at the NCBI. And they have a lot of sort of face time with the development groups here. Uh, so I think that's a very exciting thing. And uh, uh, with that, I think uh, I will stop there. And uh, I will, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. Fabulous. That was a lot of information. I want to encourage everyone to go ahead and unmute themselves if they want to ask their question uh, verbally or go ahead and chat them in uh, to everyone in the group. Um, I did receive one question already, uh, and Ben, I'm hoping you could possibly clarify some of the requirements for submissions uh, specifically to the Bankit uh, database. Um, we've got a user who's submitted several sequences but then has gotten responses uh, from the contractors who say that their sequence input has been discarded. Could you maybe enlighten us about what uh, that process might be and what might be the problem? And I'm thinking, did we lose? Oh, we've got Ben muted right now, so we will have to unmute him. Sorry, just a little snafu there. He's unmuted now. Ben, did you hear that question? He did hear that question, and so nobody's uh, Nobody's stuff should ever be discarded. That would be sort of strange and alarming to me. But uh, if you ever do have problems of that nature or other things at NCBI, one thing that I would really recommend doing is, is emailing info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. That goes to the NCBI service desk and they track every single email. So if there was something discarded, um, they will go ahead and follow up uh, with the, the genomes group and figure out what's going on with that. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of one of those white whale things. Once in a while we, we hear of people's sequences being discarded, but it's, it's very, very rare. Uh, and so uh, really if something like that happened, uh, what we should do is, is just work to get it fixed as soon as possible. Fabulous. Okay. Um, I've got another question. For some arthropods, uh, there are obviously multiple assemblies that are available for them, but it's not been clear to the community necessarily how the, the quote-unquote representative assembly is chosen because it doesn't always appear to be either the most recent or perhaps the most complete assembly. Could you perhaps explain the process of how the community, uh, of that process and then maybe how the community might be able to weigh in on choosing what we believe should be the representative assembly? That is a fantastic question, wow. And uh, what I would suggest uh, for that particular question, so that, that those choices are made by the RefSeq team. Um, and uh, so arthropods should have a specific RefSeq representative. I can't uh, bring to mind who that person is right now. Uh, but uh, what the other thing I would say uh, is that uh, there's an email alias, which is genomes at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, and that would be a fantastic place to ask that question. The other thing you could do is email info and ask for the name of the RefSeq arthropod representative. Uh, so, in fact, and who I believe is actually uh, off the top of my head, that is Terrence Murphy, who also happens to be the head of RefSeq. Okay, great. Yeah, and uh, Terrence is well well known to our communities, but a great resource for all of us. So that's that's good to know that he's also in charge of of that um, <laughs> process. Um, let's see. So when submitting a genome assembly, what's your recommended best practice for uh, trimming adapters, contaminants, and that sort of thing from scaffolds based on the contamination report that's generated by, by NCBI, um, especially those that are internal to a scaffold? Do you all have a tool that you can recommend for that process? For trimming adapters? So when you get a contamination report, you'll both get uh, adapters in within that contamination report as well as uh, possible uh, other contaminants. And so I think the question is, what's the best process for going about that? Uh, because usually that's an impediment to being able to submit an assembly. 
Right. So, I mean, that's, that's actually a, a fairly complex question. I would say that, you know, I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of the, the raw SRA reads, I mean, uh, we suggest that people soft mask adapters and, and really being able to, to put in the assembly and then also uh, tie that via bioproject to the raw SRA reads really gives you a lot of freedom to clean up your data uh, when you do the assembly. Uh, so then you can really use, use very, very uh, sort of uber clean data sets uh, when you go ahead and uh, and submit the, the actual scaffolded assemblies. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it sounds like really it's it's more uh, right now the the idea is how to avoid that becoming a problem versus being in the position to have to clean it out uh, later during the the submission phase. Um, so what you what what you're interested in is us suggesting a so we have to be a little careful because we can't actually endorse third party tools. Um, but what you're interested in is a list of suggestions of tools when the contamination report comes back uh, to be able to clean out the contamination. Yes. Okay, so that is something that actually I will go and speak with Terrence about. It is a very good question. And I think part of that, I actually have this personal question, um, is that within our response we have a, a peculiarity in that uh, the host parasite relationships involve two arthropods sometimes. <laughs> So um, not only is it interesting to, to attempt to make a genome assembly where you don't have that, the other, uh, either the host or the parasite, uh, contaminating one of them, but then uh, doing that proper screening for that contaminate, contaminant at the, in the end uh, to make sure. Because as, as we know with the contamination process that NCBI provides, they will look for bacteria, um, uh, non-arthropods. I'm not sure that, I, it's my understanding they don't look for viruses, um, but because they don't look for other arthropods, uh, there's the chance that, that genome assemblies could be contaminated when they're submitted. So the, right. I guess it's a, it's a, a community-specific question there that, that perhaps, it, as you said, that it's something that our community could work with you further on. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm actually trying to find uh, uh, our webinars page because we actually gave uh, a bit of a webinar from the biosample perspective about uh, submitting complex biosamples like that. Um, and so if you search our webinars page uh, for biosample, um, there may be some insights into that. But yeah, in terms of complex arthropod submission, again, uh, that's that's probably something uh, where we should set up a call uh, with Terrence, and uh, I, I probably should have had him uh, sitting in the room today. No problem, no problem. Um, I just want to go ahead, um, go. I, oh, anybody that wants to to speak up, go ahead and do that now. I'll give you a moment for that versus reading off some of the questions we have here. Hey, Anna, I have a question, um, or actually, Ben. <laughs> Hi, this is Monica Polshaw. Thanks for the great talk. It's been really interesting. And I'll probably have some other questions offline for you later, but I had a question about your magic blast workflow, where you could just uh, pull straight from SRA and map against your genome. So often when you yeah. do that, you want to do a trimming step um, in between to trim out low quality part portions of your reads or adapters. Um, is there a way to, to kind of build that into the middle um, of the workflow? Oh, because um, that's when, you, when you actually do, when you want to have production ready mapped data, you do kind of want to do that QC step in between. Is, are there thoughts to, to have ways to build that in between? So that's a great question, and you're not the first, second, or tenth person to ask me. Uh, so I think the, okay. the next, uh, the, so, so there's sort of two answers. One is, yeah, I mean, enough people have asked that we're just going to build it. So the plan is to build a prototype uh, in June at the Boulder Hackathon. Uh, on that very specific thing, just basically having um, an SRA-enabled uh, trimmer, so basically, you know, fast QC, uh, able to, to take up SRA and then just basically move straight to Magic Blast. Uh, that's one strategy. The other strategy that uh, my group employs uh, quite a bit is uh, basically just doing post hoc trimming. So looking at mapping quality and looking at read quality after mapping. <coughs> 
and then and then actually cutting off uh, either systematic or sort of low quality mapping events. Okay, great. Sorry, it takes a while to unmute here. Um, that, do you have a tool specifically? So you, you get a, a BAM file or a SAM file's output, and is there a tool to actually go straight, do the the, 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 the um, trimming on the BAM file? Um, I don't have a specific tool for you, but a, a number exists in the community. So, I mean, we don't, yeah, we, we, we don't have a particular one we use, but I mean, there, there are a number of tools for that. And, and yeah, I mean, that, that actually would make sense to have something where we actually have a modular workflow uh, and a number of tools that you can use for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's a really good point. I mean, you know, uh, just saying, I mean, ideally, in my personal opinion, what we should have is something like, you know, here's Magic Blast, and then here, here are a number of postdoc trimming options, and these things are dockerized, and there's a Jupyter notebook or workflow language that drives the workflow uh, for folks. Hi, Ben. Uh, this is Chris. I have, it's kind of a, it, it's a, it's a procedural question, I guess. So I was wondering, um, if I submit my genome, I can also submit my annotations to it, right? Yes. And that gets put in one place. But now I guess my question is, if I'm not the submitter of a genome, I can submit my annotations in the third party annotation in the like the third party annotation database, right? That's correct. Yes. Is is there a way like if later I become a collaborator or I, I get the approval of the actual submitter, is there a way to like move it from the third party annotations into the like a blessed by the submitter annotations database? Because they're two separate databases, right? Yep, they are two separate databases, and the submitter can actually submit a request via, right now via email, although we're working on a programmatic way to do that. Uh, the submitter can submit a request via email to do something like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So this is Anna again. I have another question here. So with longer read sequencing, not only are we producing the assemblies of the, the organism of interest, but also some of the bacteria and viruses um, that it hosts. And you just mentioned that there was the complex biosample submission process. Would that be the best way um, not to submit, once we can remove these from the main genome assembly and we have them as a separate uh, set of, of assemblies, what, is that the, going to be the best way to submit those additional sequences in CBI? All right, run, run me through this again. So you have, you have, ho you're, you have reads deep enough where you have post, then you have metagenome, and then you've actually taken the metagenome and you've assembled some of them. Yes? Yes. Is that, is that the situation? Yeah, okay. especially with high c um, uh, sequences and things, those can be scaffolded. So uh, I'm wondering where those um, secondary products of the genome assembly process should be submitted. Right. So the way I would do it if it were me as a user is uh, what I would do is submit the host reads uh, just depending on sort of what they're being used for uh, and the metagenome reads as two separate submissions. Um, and then what I would do is I would go ahead and any assemblies, I mean, we're assuming we have very, very deep reads here, but any assemblies I had done off the metagenomic samples that were novel, I would go ahead and submit those as separate assemblies. Um, but linking everything in an umbrella bio project. So basically what you can do is you can set up the bio project so you have one bio project over the whole project, and then I would have three separate bio projects, one for the sort of host reads, one for the metagenomic reads, and then one for the assemblies. Okay, fabulous. Uh, is there anyone who else who wants to ask a question? I think I saw Margaret may, Margaret Allen may have a, had her hand raised. And, uh, if anybody else has a question, go ahead and please um, either type in or or go ahead and speak up. Don't forget, if you're on a phone-only connection, you should say star six into your telephone to unmute. So, okay. I actually do have another question for you, Ben. 
Um, so a lot of these services allow for batch, like batch requests, like doing REST calls. And it seems like they have different um, ideas on how frequently you can either post or check for responses. Is there like a prefer, is there like, well, one, a preferred way to set them up? And also, is there like, um, is there like a better way to find what those, what those su suggested limits are for, say? Uh, so Eric Sayers, uh, who sort of sits above the education program at this point, has been doing lots of webinars on uh, the API keys. Um, so you can check those out. And then actually it's either the very end of this month or the very beginning of June, myself and Jonathan Kahn's are going to be doing a webinar on eDirect where we'll talk about post and how to grab uh, a whole bunch of sequences from uh, post. So, uh, but I, I would check out the stuff Eric has done so far in terms of the, uh, the API keys. Um, basically one way uh, to, to do it now is uh, just and, and actually I'd suggest this sort of moving forward, is uh, grab an API key uh, from your MyNCBI account. That'll allow you a lot more bandwidth. Okay, great. And I just wanted to check uh, with you, Ben, before we wrap up here. Um, you mentioned a lot of tools that have been developed through these hackathons, and it looked like several of them had their own GitHub pages. But is there a central uh, repository or GitHub page which references all of these out in order to make these easier to find? So, yeah, I mean, so there's the raw GitHub page. So everything is on GitHub. Uh, and there's a raw GitHub page, which is just GitHub and CBI hackathons. Uh, and uh, you can check that out. That has lots and lots of stuff on it. But some of that is, some of that's alpha, some of it's concept, some of that's pre-concept. And so a page I would suggest checking out is the NCBI dash hackathons page. That's going to have a whole bunch of products which are sort of mostly alpha or beta. Um, and so you can check those out. I mean, some of them are still kind of conceptual, but others are, are a little bit more fleshed out. All right, well, wonderful. I'm going to give one more moment here to see if anyone wants to speak up. And if not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I can try and unmute all. All right, well, we're go I guess we've reached the end of the hour. We'll go ahead and wrap up for today. I want to remind everyone that we will not have a webinar in June due to the timing of the arthropod genomic symposium, uh, but we'll, we will be back in July, and at this point it looks like we'll be having a webinar from the Illumina group. Uh, so Ben, I want to thank you so much for all of the information you presented, and uh, thank everyone for calling in. I hope to see you on our next webinar. Great. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye.